Thank you everyone for coming. Wow, that's loud. Hi, Revan. If you're still trickling in, please take a seat. Welcome, I'm Laura Akasatia, Director and Head Horticulturist of Lurie Garden. We're so pleased to have you here this evening. I just wanna let you know that we wanna thank all of our members and supporters for helping make this and all of our other programs possible. There's some information about joining the garden as a member at the front table. And I've also given each person a survey to fill out. If you have that, that'd be great if you're able to fill that out and turn it in at the end. Um, that helps us to know how we can better serve our community. Um, we do have some upcoming programs we'd like to tell you about. We have a pollinator walk this Thursday, so just in two days. How convenient to have something of the same theme this week. And um, you can sign up for that through Eventbrite on our website. We also have an event coming up in October called Urban Wild. So if this talk about pollen has inspired you and you're interested in the garden and that we have honeybees, we'll be selling our honey that day. Um, we, it's kind of like a night market on the Pritzker stage. And, and it's the only chance you'll have to um, get our honey. So we'll have a number of vendors. It's a free event, music. And so we welcome you to join us on the Pritzker stage. It's Thursday, October 10th. And um, we also have Hee and Kim, a botanic artist, the only artist to be in the Oppenheimer Gallery, the only living artist to be in the Oppenheimer Gallery. She is a beautiful, she does beautiful, very detailed drawings of native plants to our region. And that is um, coming up also, you can find that on our website as part of our, part of our fall programs. Um, the bathrooms, by the way, are to your left and down this ramp. So those are much more convenient than the ones downstairs, so that's for you to find. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is getting, um, this is on film, on CAN TV, so um, just so that you're aware of that. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, um, we will, I, I guess I should also tell you that this will be about 45 minute presentation, maybe an hour. Um, we're gonna begin with Dr. Edland, and then Peggy McNamara is gonna um, contribute some more slides, and then after that we'll do a Q&A. So they're gonna tell you about a project they're working on together. And how I came to um, meet both of them, actually, is I saw Dr. Edlin give a talk at the SAIC. Um, so she was an ad, a traveling adjunct professor, and I was really interested in her topic and was so wowed by her presentation and how engaged the students were and the amazing questions they had. So we do welcome you to ask questions at the end of this presentation, and um, hopefully we have a really good conversation here. I have two assistants here from Lori Garden, Peter and Yuritza, and they have microphones, and so they will come find you um, so that you can have your question into the microphone so that everyone can hear it. Peggy McNamara is currently an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an artist in residence at the Field Museum. She has published seven books, including Painting Wildlife in Watercolor, and my personal favorite, Insects of Illinois. I use that book all the time. It helps narrow down the types of insects that you might find in Lurie Garden. I'm always trying to identify the insects I see because we have so many of them. Um, and she also has five books with the University of Chicago Press, including that book about the insects of Illinois. She's gonna be available during the reception after, the, after questions to sign any books that you may have brought with you. And I also welcome you to join the reception to see her original artwork, including what you see behind them right now. Um, Dr. Edlund, Dr. Anna Edlund, is an associate professor and chair of biology at Bethany College in West Virginia, where she teaches developmental biology and studies pollen grains and the cells they contain. On two sabbaticals, she was a scientist in residence at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is where I saw her once, and a Fulbright Research Scholar at the Royal Museum of Natural History in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, she's a self-proclaimed pollen evangelist, and you will definitely find that as you listen to her talk. Um, to date, she also has um, 50, been cited over 1,500 times through her scholarly articles, so she is quite an accomplished scientist. We're in this beautiful room with all these great thinkers written on on the walls here. So I feel like she really fits in with the mood that is set by this gorgeous room. And I welcome you to hear, we'll begin with Dr. Edlund.
Well, thank you all. I am so glad to be here tonight. Um, I thought we would start our story back in the 1600s, and we'll work up from there to the work that I'm currently doing to the present day with Peggy McNamara and a book that we're working on together. But let's go back to the 1600s first. And in the mid-1600s, um, the first microscopes became available. So people could see pollen grains to draw pollen art. And um, this is a picture of Antony von Leeuwenhoek's first microscope. It was smaller than your palm. And you would stand next to the light at the window to see some specimen that you had mounted onto the needle here and look at it through this tiny, tiny little lens. All right, once you had these microscopes, you could start drawing, um, you could start drawing fleas the size of a cat. Um, and in 1662, um, Micrographia came out, which uh, was a, a revelation. It revealed the beauty of the microscopic world to the general public. Um, it sold out the first day, and uh, Samuel Pepys, who kept a journal through the 1600s, he kept it during the plague, during the Great Fire of London. Many historians look at his journals. He got a copy. He was lucky enough to get a copy of this book by um, Robert Hooke. And in Micrographia, um, Hooke drew many things, not just a flea. But that night, um, Pepys said he stayed up all night by candlelight reading the book, and that it was, in fact, the most ingenious book that ever I read in my life. Well, since then, we've gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and we now know that we, smaller than the flea, there are many things like a flea that live on the flea, and even smaller. So, um, and then of course the flea itself is made of cells. Um, here's a picture of a weevil that we can see is hosting dozens of plants, mites, many other organisms are living on this organism. And um, in the 1800s, this marvel um, led Augustus de Morgan to write a poem that says, big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. And the great fleas themselves in turn have greater fleas to go on, while these again have greater still and greater still, and so on. All right, so into the 1900s, um, we now know that even the cell, which you would think would be the smallest unit of life, is composed of smaller cells. Um, in 1960, Lynn Margulis discovered that um, the mitochondria inside of our cells are actually bacterial cells that had um, at one time been free living, but now had moved inside of us. This is what we would call a single cell organism, a protist, but if we look at its genome, we discover that it has the genomes of five different organisms living inside of it. So um, it, this includes uh, two species of bacterial spirochetes, which are these um, long hair-like projections on the outside of the cell. And those are what it's using to swim around, and the source of its name, which is mixotrica. Trica is a hair. So this has paradoxical hairs. They're actually separate little cells that together create a composite organism of five genomes. So what Wow, is there any limit to how small we can get? Um, so, not only are the cells of the world tiny, but they're incredibly numerous. Um, by numerous, I mean um, more numerous than the stars. Um, and I was trying to think of a way to capture not only the tiny scale of the cell, but the number, the scale in numbers. And I thought, well, what if every cell on Earth lit up and we could see it like a little spot of light? And then we'd be able to see 
you know, no matter how tiny it was, we'd be able to see this little spot of light. Well, I didn't really have to imagine that because in fact, there are glowing organisms that um, do this. <laughs> they're, uh, they're bioluminescent and you can see them. Every one of them is glowing here along this beach. And um, they're called dinoflagellates or they're little tenophores, things that um, maybe some of you have swum among them and when your arms move through the water, they sparkle around your arms. So it turns out that while there are only 10 to the 11th or about 100 billion stars um, in our galaxy, there are some 10 to the 6th dinoflagellates in just this much water in a cubic centimeter. All right, that's enough so that when they have a huge bloom, they clog the gills of fish um, and they can cause fish uh, kills when you get that many cells in the water. Um, so you can imagine uh, what we're really talking about is 10 to the 30th. These are enormous numbers. Quintillion would be 10 to the 17th or something. So the number of cells on Earth is astounding. They're tiny and they're numerous. And what I want to say um, is that they're beautiful as well. And I want to show you some pictures of how beautiful they are tonight. Um, we don't even really need them to light up because um, from space you can see them. Many of them are photosynthetic and uh, they turn the water a different color. You can see these green swirls are off the coast of India and um, from space looking down you can see where there are blooms of organisms living in the water at these tremendous densities in the water. So um, they change the color of our planet. Um, they are tiny, they are numerous, they are beautiful, and they are mighty. They do incredible things for us, like make 60% of our oxygen on Earth is made by diatoms, little microscopic organisms, photosynthetic things that live in the ocean. And they fix tons and tons of carbon. They take carbon out, CO2 from our air, and bring it down to the bottom of the ocean, where their skeletons can amass a kilometer deep on the bottom of the ocean, carrying down um, what's called marine snow, carrying the carbon down out of our air. So tiny, numerous, beautiful, and mighty. Well, my favorite one is pollen of all of these cell types. Um, and it's been a lifelong love of mine. I really have um, always been attracted to this cell. But I have to say when I'm on airplanes and a stranger asks me what I do, and I say I study pollen, I study something that's despised. <laughs> Everybody says, oh, I wish you could get rid of it. Oh, it's terrible stuff. Um, and then I have to become, like I said to uh, Laura, an evangelist. And try to tell them what really is pollen and how beautiful it is and how mighty it is. And um, so most people, if they know about pollen, know um, the troubles it causes for allergy. So I took this picture from the New York Times. You can um, check people's pollen allergies by pricking them in different spots along their back. And this poor man is allergic to quite a few of them. You can see he's, um, <laughs> he's got those red welts. Um, this is a picture of the Texas juniper, a tree can put out 35 pounds of pollen. Um, this number up here, a single ragweed plant can produce a billion pollen grains from a single plant. Remember I said that the stars in our galaxy is only 100 billion in our whole galaxy, okay? So this is one ragweed plant that can do this. Um, and if you are allergic to the Texas juniper, you can check the news media. They tell the newspapers and the televisions about the counts of pollen. And you might find one day that there are 28,000 grains per cubic meter in the air that day. Perhaps you don't wish to go out. Okay, um, so those are the kinds of numbers I got that from, in fact, the Texas news media. I was kind of curious how many grains per meter cubed. We have a lot of things in place for counting pollen grains. Um, I actually took this series of photos um, at the Stockholm Natural History Museum where they're in charge of providing the counts. If you ever wondered who provides the counts to um, the newspaper and the television, it's scientists like those that I worked with there. And this is a sticky 
tape roll with a vacuum that sucks in the air over a set period, and, the, and then you take the strips of sticky tape off and count. So here she is with the sticky tape, and she's measuring out a certain length of it, and then she puts it under the microscope and scores the different species that she sees, and so this is her counting on a counter, and then writing down on this page the different species and how many of those she found on the sticky tape as it ran and sucked the air in over that 24 hour period. And she can report a number to the media about the pollen counts. Well, most people maybe have seen a number like that. Maybe they know that pollen is sperm, um, but they don't know how beautiful it is. So um, most of the world never sees these tiny beauties. And here is a painting by Peggy McNamara of the beauty of the pollen grain. And from here on, I'm just going to be showing you pictures and pictures of pollen grains um, to try to rectify this problem that people don't know how pretty they are. OK. So let's go back to 1682 again. Um, the very first time that anybody saw a pollen grain was Nehemiah Grew, we think, in 1682, and he drew them. In fact, anybody who has ever seen a pollen grain has just got to draw them. They're gorgeous. They're like little um, snowflakes. Like, like um, They're just these beautiful little things, incredibly diverse. Nehemiah Grew um, was the first man to notice that they were different for different species. So as many different species as there are flowers. You have that many different forms to the pollen grain. And so if we look at the drawing that he made in 1682, you see that the mallow pollen is large and a little bit spiky compared to the pansy, which has these cuboidal smaller grains compared to the snapdragon, which is really tiny indeed. Okay, so he noticed these things um, and drew them. I took a student with me. Um, he was a biology major and an art minor, and I thought it would be fun for us to go to Kew Gardens in um, London. Actually, this previous picture, that's me holding Nehemiah Grew's book from 1682 at the Kew Gardens. I was pretty excited to hold it in my hands. Um, but we looked at other original art about pollen, um, going back to the 1700s, um, who was drawing pollen through those early microscopes. Um, and and uh, Franz Bauer did these beautiful panels. They came to me, I asked for them from the rare book collections, and they brought them out on carts, these huge folios. And um, most of them not published. No one's ever seen these pictures. Unless you visit the Kew Gardens, you can then look at them and hold them in your own hands. So this is um, Passiflora, passion flower pollen, um, drawn in the 1700s. Here's um, German scientist Frisch drawing in, in the early 1800s um, other species. Um, this was one of my favorite, Charles White. He had drawn thousands and thousands of species. I took photos of them all <laughs> because nobody has them other than the Kew Gardens. Um, it has all of his really delicate little pencil drawings, never published, of pollen grains that he saw through his microscope in the early 1800s. Here are some more. Cunningham. We're moving up in time. Fisher, 1890. Roger Wodehouse, our American contributor to this. So he, in the early 1900s, drew, um, there's a big fat book of his drawings, which I love. I feel they're almost, um, it's like you run your eyes over them like braille. I can almost feel them, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, the texture, the sculpting on the surface of Wodehouse's drawings. So he did this without an electron microscope. It's extraordinary, the detail that he has here. It looks like he was looking through an electron microscope, but he just had a simple monocular microscope um, that he drew these from. Here's the Japanese version, which looks actually kind of Japanese to me, Yamasaki, um, drawing anime Paul and grains. All right. And then um, Dorothy Hodges. So her entire collection of drawings was at the Kew Gardens. Um, in the 1950s, she was a professional artist who kept uh, bees. And she got really interested in the colors of the loads of pollen that were on the bees' legs. And she painted them here. These are three different loads from the legs of the bees, her honeybees, um, from a particular flower. So down here it says early to late spring, and then we could see that red dead nettle has 
this kind of color to it. Three different loads, painted very carefully. The books are really expensive because they're hand painted, they're not mass produced. So she was matching the colors. Um, but she also drew through the microscope some of the pollen grains um, that she, like in large collections, this is what they would look like, their color. But singularly, this is what a grain looked like. And she drew um, hundreds of them. And those drawings are all at the Kew Gardens, and you can visit them and see their lovely, delicate pencil drawings. Modern day artists have also been captivated by this, professional artists, um, and they're mostly using photographs, not drawings anymore, as you might expect. Um, and here, what you can see what they'll do is they'll take an electron microscope image and colorize it. So Martin and Rob both do this. And there's actually, if you're captivated by this, um, Rob Kessler's book, Pollen, is really a lovely one. Huge coffee table book full of colored images. Not real color, not like Dorothy Hodge's real colors, right? But um, artificial, pseudo color that he's applied just for effect, okay? Um, but Pollen, you don't need to pseudo color them because they actually have their own beautiful colors. Um, but you can go to Paldat, this is free, and there are thousands and thousands of species. You can get on Paldat and people upload their images, scientists do. So you can look up almost anything and do searches within um, Paldat. Uh, that's short for palynology database. Palynologists are people who study pollen. <laughs> and, um, and so palynologists will upload their images to Paldat. And it's become a huge collection um, that's available um, to, to look at these strange forms with different sorts of openings on the cell. This one has spirals around. Um, they're really lovely and diverse. And you can search, you know, ones that have four openings or ones that have, you know, that are oblong or um, whatever search terms you want to find, uh, different pollen species. Well, here's where I want to say, I don't know if you noticed this, but all the pictures that I just showed you, the pollen grain could as well be dead. There was no particular life about it. It sort of was just all structural and superficial, the pictures that I was showing you. But I'm a biologist, and I'm interested in the function of the form, right? So not just the form itself, but how it functions. So where's the living cell in all these pictures? They were just drawings of walls or photographs of walls. Of the, of the dead cell wall around the outside of the cell. So my research is actually on the living cell inside and how it interacts with that wall, so form and function. So I want to remind you what the function of a pollen grain is. Right? So here we have a flower um, with anthers that produce the pollen grains. Those are sperm, right? They contain the sperm nuclei for sexual reproduction in flowers. And they'll get dusted onto what's called the stigma of the flower. And then a, a cell, a long pollen tube, will come out of the grain. It will escape those beautiful walls and leave those beautiful walls behind, up on the stigma. And what you see here is this yellow line is the pollen tube, and it's navigating down through the flower to fertilize. Right? Now, next time that you make corn on the cob and you pull all of those threads off your corn cob, those are each a path. If you were to follow them, you would see it runs one to each kernel, right? And each kernel must be fertilized or it will just, it won't be a seed with an embryo in it. It would just have the egg, but it wouldn't be fertilized. So the pollen tubes have to come down and visit every single corn kernel to fertilize it, or every seed in your watermelon, for instance, to fertilize every one of those so that they can contain an embryo and grow a new plant. So the sperm, once it's pollinated onto the um, flower, its journey is not done. It needs to navigate um, to go and fertilize. And that was what my postdoctoral research was on, was how do those cells find their way to the ovules to fertilize them. 
Um, here are some pictures from my own um, research publications. So this is a picture of um, that carpel of a flower um, with the pollen grain. I was very interested in these stages where the pollen grain lands on the female, swells with water, hydrates, and then the, cell, the pollen tube emerges and navigates its way down to the ovule where it fertilizes. All right, so this was a picture I used in one of my publications. You can see the pollen hydrating. It swells dramatically from being sort of like a raisin back up into a grape, right? So it hydrates with the juice from the stigma. It travels, spends most of its time in a very desiccated form and then lands on the juicy stigma and swells up. And then it does what's called germinating, just like we use the same verb for a seed, it germinates and the long pollen tube comes out of it. And here you can see um, hundreds and hundreds of pollen. Um, the cells have come out and they're rushing towards um, the ovules. So you see each of these lines, they're racing towards each other in huge numbers. You often have many more pollen tubes than you do ovules, just as we do in human reproduction. Here's some um, movie stills for you. I wanted you to see uh, the actual thing in action. Um, so this is one of my undergraduate students made this movie of a pollen grain. And what you're going to see is the grain um, on the stigma. Um, it will swell. You'll see it get bigger with the fluid. And then you'll be able to see it germinate and the cell come out. So let me get us there and we'll maybe watch this twice through because it's gorgeous. All right, so here's the pollen grain swelling. There's the tube, it's out and it's heading down into the flower. All right, let's watch it one more time. Desiccated grain swelling. And there's the tube, out and heading down into the female. So I got very interested in that escape, that a moment when it came out. How did it break through the wall? What kind of forces would be needed for that? And I actually started measuring those in pico-newtons, <laughs> the force. How hard is it to break out of a pollen grain? And how do you know where to go? And how do you aim towards the female? And this has become one of my research subjects. And um, so these are pictures from one of my publications showing a bulge where the cell is starting to push on the side of the grain and is on its way out. You can see something is swelling, this clear area beneath. And I stained it and I could see that it was made of pectin. And I could see that the wall above it was changing as it pushed its way out of the pollen grain. And then I took a transmission electron micrograph. Here it shows that swelling. And then notice the wall right here is thinner than it is up here. So something is happening to that wall. Perhaps it's a two-part mechanism. You swell and push from the inside and you thin and weaken the wall on the outside so that the pollen tube can get out. Well, I started to get so interested in pollen walls and how they resisted these forces that I needed some help and I turned to the only man I know, the only artist, who's really drawn pollen grains with the insides still showing. Right? I didn't want just all those pictures of the surfaces of the pollen grain. As pretty as they are, they were not useful to me in my research on pollen germination. So I turned to Gunnar Ertmann. Gunnar Ertmann um, was born 1887, um, and as a um, very young man, he became quite eminent in Sweden. Um, and his book is probably on everybody's uh, everybody's pollen biologists, I mean, all of our bookshelves, all right? So um, I pulled my Gunnar Ertmann book off the shelf and I was looking at the cross sections that he drew of the walls. So here's one of the illustrations from his book and you'll notice right away that this picture is, well, I think, better than the other pictures. And the reason I think it's better <laughs> by useful 
that more useful because it has um, the pollen grain itself and then cross sections that show the wall and um, even high magnification images of the wall showing the details of the different layers of the wall and then he also shows different um, perspectives here plus this series here called the Lux Obscura Test Panel um, and that uh, Here's another one of the, his illustrations. You'll see he often has these Lux Obscura tests. These are him slicing through with the microscope. As he turned the microscope, he would draw what it looked like at each depth as he went through the grain. So they're amazingly rich illustrations. Here's another one. You can see where the layers are thicker here and thinner here, and you can really get a lot of detail about the wall. So these kinds of drawings are called palinograms, and that's like the standard way that people draw pollen nowadays. If, you're, if you publish something about pollen grains, you would probably draw it as a palinogram, and that's all based on Gunnar Erpmann's work. Um, and he really was doing something different than other people before him. I thought that his drawings were really intense. They had a lot of meaning. In fact, we could speak of their data density. They had very high data density. It didn't take very much ink to get a lot of information across, right? Um, so if you look at that ratio between the amount of information and the amount of ink, his have a lot of information. Um, and their energy is raised by having multiple planes and perspectives in the same illustration. So I wrote a Fulbright um, and asked if I could go to Stockholm, Sweden to study him and to try to figure out how he came to draw so differently from the other illustrators of pollen grains. Um, he wasn't doing anything particularly new except that he was doing it about pollen. But by not new, I mean 400 years before him, Leonardo da Vinci had certainly done a similar sort of thing. He would make things transparent or dissect, cut away something and show something that was partly dissected and partly whole. He did multiple perspectives. These are all Leonardo da Vinci drawings from the 1400s. Um, multiple perspectives. He would even do exploded views where he would take things apart and show the components. Components. So these were not new inventions that Ehrman was applying to, to the pollen grain. Um, and I thought uh, it really would be worthwhile to discover why the man started doing it <laughs> at all. What was behind it? Um, why did he turn to these, uh, this approach? Um, I think part of it had to do with his penetrating gaze. Um, and this is something that perhaps biologists, well, Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize um, for studying corn kernels, when asked what she did that she would notice the genetic details of the corn kernels so well, she said, well, I just leaned into the kernel. Right? So a penetrating gaze, looking at something and not being satisfied with the superficialities of it, but leaning into the kernel, or in this case, I felt that Ehrman was leaning into the pollen grain. Um, here's a quote from Thomas Mann, um, who was writing in Dr. Faustus, this is just a novel, literature, but there's a scientist in his literature um, who is talking about the beautiful patterns on the surface of seashells and wondering why are they so lovely? You know, sea creatures can't even see them. They're down in the muck, and, and it's not even like a peacock where a girl would appreciate the boy's um, glory or anything. It's just, why, why make them so beautiful? And um, I'll read the whole thing. This is lovely. It said, it has turned out to be impossible to get at the meaning of these marks. They refuse themselves to our understanding and will painfully enough continue to do so. But when I say refuse, that is merely the negative of reveal and that nature painted these ciphers to which we lack the key merely for ornament on the shell of her creature. Nobody can persuade me. Ornament and meaning always run alongside each other. The old writings too served for both ornament and communication. Nobody can tell me that there is nothing to communicate here, that it is an inaccessible communication. To plunge into this contradiction is also a pleasure. So I would argue that if you just snap a photo through a microscope, you're not leaning into the grain, nor are you plunging into anything. It's a pretty hasty 
hasty little moment. And that maybe the early guys that were drawing or Ehrtman hand drawing with a pencil and a monocular microscope, because he didn't have an electron microscope, it was a gift. He saw things and he went deeper and he had a penetrating gaze. I also think uh, the timing was good. So Gunnar Ehrtman was living, um, his contemporary was actually Picasso and he owned Picassos. Um, they hung in his home, Gunnar Ehrtman's home. And um, his father was a professional artist. So he grew up in a home filled with art. Um, he himself drew quite a bit as a, um, well, his whole life. But even as a young boy, I could go, um, uh, the Fulbright funded me to go to the Stockholm Museum where his wife had turned in all of his boxes of papers and lab notebooks and um, journals and sketch pads and everything They're up in the attic. I could sit on the floor of the attic of the Natural History Museum and dig through them all. And I found um, his sketches from when he was, you know, eight, nine, six, like little boy sketches in there. And boy, was he gifted. And in some cases, they were in his father's sketch pads. And they usually signed them, but there were a few. I didn't know if the father or the son had done them which is saying something, you know, if you're a 10-year-old kid and you can't tell from a professional artist's drawings. So he was really very gifted very early on with art and interested in it. And um, what I put up here was his interest perhaps in cubism had an effect on his drawings as well. Though this is me just kind of hand-waving, but maybe it did. Um, so these are quotes from Joseph Plaskett about cubist art. And um, he was pointing out at this time, say in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, cubism came about because in the process of analyzing form, something that lay in the form, a plane could be lifted out to float on its own. So when he drew those planes cutting through the pollen grain, he could lift a plane out, just like cubist art. Um, and furthermore, I had, this is Joseph Plaskett talking, I had always made pictures as I thought I saw the world, focusing on what lay in front, but this is not how one sees the world. It only frames the center and and cuts off the lateral vision which lies unfocused. Now I found that I could turn my eye to the adjacent field of vision, seeing another focus, an extension which I added to the original. And you can see that on this Picasso. We've gone through some layers of her clothing. We've captured her from several different perspectives in the same painting, right? Um, so instead of stopping at two focuses, I looked further to the side, adding another and yet another. So Ehrtman also did this. Um, um, he came around the side of the pollen grain and showed several different perspectives from up above, from down below, and from around. Here are some of the pictures from his sketchbooks. Um, so he didn't only draw pollen, he was drawing in his sketchbooks all sorts of things. Um, and I think they're just marvelous. Uh, he was constantly drawing everywhere he went. There were an incredible number of sketchbooks in these boxes. Um, I think that one here is probably a self-portrait and this would be a man who has flowers on his brain and who spends a great deal of time looking through a monocular microscope <laughs> would be my guess. Um, so he was, he was a really gifted artist. These look quite modern um, to us but he was doing them you know at the well 20s, 30s. All right, so going back to his childhood, here are some pictures. Um, this is an Ehrtman drawing from when he was 14 years old. And he was already obsessed with anthers. And that's what it says down here, anthers from different flowers. And his signature, summer 1912, or so he was really young. And, um, and he was drawing all these different uh, uh, anthers from different flowers arranged, I think, in a way that shows that he cared about composition and cared about color, um, even at, at such a young age. Here was a series of pictures from um, his school uh, when he was 16 years old. And if I'm just going to flip through them, you'll see page by page. And um, he's drawn these circles, which I believe are the field through the microscope. And then he puts what he sees in that circular field through the microscope. But composition is clearly important to him. These don't look like just any old scientific illustration. Here's another. Another. Look, he's even looking at that optical property where the circles are touching one another and you get this diffraction um, that happens in microscopes when two things touch each other. 
each one different. They were just marvelous. And he also drew maps. This, he became very interested in the pollen grains that are in the earth and how you could tell by sampling them what used to live there. Had there been an ice age? When had this area been underwater? Um, and so he drew these maps at age 16 um, with different areas. And he argued that this had probably at one time been a separate island from this, and the water had come up across. This is all a 16-year-old boy's drawings. I wanted to flip through his college books for you so you could get a little glimpse of them. Um, it was humbling. I don't know how he found time to keep these. He, was, um, he knew many languages. When he read French, he took notes in French, German in German, English in English. His notes were always in the language that he was reading. He knew Latin. He named many things. Um, his, a nomenclator, not only an illustrator, but a nomenclator. He named the layers of the pollen grains that he was seeing. He named things. Um, so here are, he had a whole bunch of these books. Now, um, Gunnar Ertmann finished college and graduate school in four years. He was the youngest PhD in Sweden at age 21. When he got leave from his um, military service, you have mandatory military service in Sweden, and he got leave to come back and defend his thesis and then go back to the military um, at age 21. And so here is his notebook and I'll just show you me flipping through it so you can see the pages. Oops. My notebooks do not look like this. And there were just boxes of these. In fact, the notebooks had um, at the back a reference. You could look up a particular species and it would send you to pages within the notebook where you might find um, maps or details about that species. So we went back and did an index for them. If I fast forward a little bit, we'll get to, he transferred, oh, there you go, maps into his books. He must have used tissue paper. I don't know how he got such beautiful maps and the proportions and all in there. Okay. So I also got to snoop and read his journals. You know, like his little, day, like where he wrote notes about his bad dreams and how he woke up and there were good stars. And I could really snoop through all of his notes. He took a trip in the 1930s um, to North America and went on a pollen collecting tour across North America. Um, he had to, in the frozen tundra, he wanted to take these, um, uh, cores down into the earth. He had to heat the coring metal, he says, red hot so that he could melt it through the frozen tundra to bring up the cores. Um, so uh, this is a little map from one of his journals. It shows how the contents of his backpack were arranged. And Gunnar Ertmann um, was a, flu a flute player. He played in an um, amateur orchestra his whole life. And in many of his drawings, this is a lithograph he made um, playing a flute, or here is a self-portrait. He's sitting on a batula pollen and playing his flute. Um, this is him out on the field, and here you can see he brought his floyt, his flute, with him in his backpack, and his axe and glass vials and his tobacco. You can see what was in his backpack so that he could reach into the right po pocket to pull things out. So um, here is from 1919, his um, notebooks in college, uh, and he's drawing pollen grains, enjoying their different scales. But he's not gotten this palinogram style that you were to see by the 1950s. So I watched that style form in his lab notebooks and in his notes. Um, here's a lab notebook drawing, and I think perhaps he just got lazy and he didn't want to draw that surface over the entire thing, so he just drew one sector of it. 
you know? And then he has the measurements of how high up this little spine was and details about it written in the lab notebook. This is for no one else's eyes but his. There was an entire wall of these lab notebooks and I just, I reached for the one for the flower I study um, to pull off what, what was in that book, you know? Um, he just knew an incredible amount. Um, and had looked at so many of them carefully. But by 1940s, he's starting to try to capture the different angles, the different perspectives um, that I talked about. So this is the surface of a pollen grain, and then this is a cut through to show right at that pore, he's drawn it sort of floating on top. But he wasn't satisfied with that. He tried, maybe if I cut through deeper and deeper through, and I arrange them sort of like um, pizza, slices, that would capture as I move deeper and deeper through the grain. Now, I don't know if that works. He tried cutting at an angle obliquely across the pollen grain, and here you'd be seeing the wall and cross section, and here you'd be seeing it, the smooth surface. All right, so he's trying different ways to capture the innards and the exterior at the same time, and ultimately he settles on this design which became the standard, the polynogram, um, with just part of it, the surface, and then always this lux obscuritas as you focus through the higher magnification above and a different perspective to the side. And then he would just do all of his illustrations like that. And that's the classic book from 1952 that we all have on our bookshelves, <laughs> um, is his drawings that were done like this when he finally settled on how he was gonna do it. All right, so after that sabbatical, I was, I was hooked. I was really interested in how art affects a scientist's thinking, the way that we see the world, um, and I got this wonderful gig that was coming to the School of the Art Institute to um, teach art students about science. They're all required to take one science class, and I got to teach that science class um, to art students. But there was an extra plus to it which was that I got to take a free class. I could pick any class I wanted and take the class um, myself. So a scientist taking an art class. So I chose scientific illustration class that's offered by Peggy McNamara at the Field Museum all day Tuesdays from nine to four each Tuesday. I went to the Field Museum and I drew with Peggy McNamara and I didn't have the art background that my classmates did. They'd all had to apply to the school, you know, with portfolios and stuff. And I remember I remember the first day, um, they were all holding up their pencils and doing something, so I held up my pencil, you know, whatever they were doing. Um, to, to, I was really, I was kind of copying them and trying um, to, I was faking it. Um, but I did have a marvelous semester um, taking Peggy McNamara's scientific illustration class. But better yet, um, I got a chance to start showing her um, these tiny little beauties and to talk with her about the possibility of her drawing these little beauties. Um, since most of the world never sees these tiny beauties, I started showing her them. Now these are insect eggs, not pollen grains, um, and we're going to branch out here a bit from pollen um, to all sorts of tiny beauties. Um, uh, butterfly eggs, diatoms, like I mentioned, um, in the ocean, other little um, tiny, numerous, beautiful organisms. And when I showed them to Peggy, I hope I got her hooked too. And she's gonna step up and share how she came to be um, drawing at a large scale, a human scale, and then to come down to be working at the microscopic scale. And here she's working on one of the panels for our forthcoming book. So it's Peggy's turn, thanks Peggy. This Anna is quite something, right? Um, she was a, like a, having a tornado in my class. <laughs> they, they doze and they watch their iPhones and she, I'd do a demo and she'd say, well, what about the, like somebody was paying attention. It was the most. She gives a prize if you don't miss a single class. I do, I, I, I bribe them to death, but it doesn't always work. But I'm often asked, um, how have you been at the Field Museum for 40 years? So any of you artists in the audience will understand the problem of subject matter. 
I mean, you know, the figure, the landscape, the whatever. So I thought there were two reasons I went to the Field Museum. That's the second reason. Because they, um, my studio at home was sort of noisy and so. And there was free parking back in the old days in front of the Field Museum. So in my 20s, I started driving down every day. And so it was empty. It was, you know, between, you know, nine and one, I had the whole place to myself. So that was my subject matter. So as you can see, like two come up at once, yes, okay. I wandered everywhere. It wasn't science that drew me there. It was just, you know, works of art, Chinese art. Um, these panels too were like the one, yeah, this one is three sheets of anybody who does painting three sheets and each is 30 by 40 and they're all colored pencil. So what I did was like, I was inducted into the army and made tough. So everybody's a wimp that comes in and they want something done in one day and you know, that took six months. So it, you know, and I didn't even think about it. I just thought I'm doing my meditation today. It's awesome. What a good day. So, um, and I wandered around China and eventually I ended up, see this is all the Chinese stuff. Also, any artists out there, it solves the figure ground because that, my ground was as interesting as my figure. So I had architecture to draw, so I, I just couldn't get enough. But eventually I did drift into birds. By mistake, they pulled this case out into the hall. But, um, and I remember the bird scientists thinking, well, this is new and creative. Well, it was just because I wasn't a birder, you know, so if he didn't have his head, I was not upset. You know, it worked better compositionally to just cut his head off. So I did what made the artwork, and then I was called new, which is not so. But anyway, I did a lot of uh, just straight portraiture like that. Um, and the difference in looking at something in front of you and looking from a photo, it was night and day. So, you know, I think there was just more to see. Eventually, I got invited upstairs to do the book on insects, and I thought, well, I can't do insects because I measure as Anna so well demonstrated. You know, she became good at it. And I looked in the scope, and that's what I saw. And they were all Illinois insects. So I was hooked on scopes. So that became this. So I didn't, it's just sort of amazing to live here this long and not know all these tiny things around. Now while working on that, I opened up this case and there was a guy's life's work, which I could really appreciate. He collected nests for 50 years and there they were in this cabinet. And I thought, well, I think I'll do nests, which is sort of the beginning of tiny, I mean, they're this big. Okay, and I did them six feet tall. And I remember the insect guy going, why, why are you doing it six feet tall? And I was like, because it's a kid's house and they're not gonna look at this little brown thing. And they will look at that, that they can walk into that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, they're architects and they're recycling. It's just, it's all great. How about that? I didn't make up one thing that's in our ponds, probably in your ponds. You know, you have these, okay, so just the, the point of all this too is like it's teaching me beautiful design by just drawing it all day, um, I become better at it. Some of the, this is my favorite one, they didn't want to include it, but since Anna's been talking about sperm for this long, I thought I'll throw this one in too. So um, this, this nest isn't really a nest, it's just a motel. So he paints it and he decorates it and then he sings a song and hopefully she'll have sex with him. So that, that one, they were like, well, it's not a nest. I said, well, you know, we can have a little fun in here. So I, this is my Irish Catholic and this guy has the most eggs of all. And so I went through this whole period just, um, I can't tell you how much fun I was having. How could you have more fun than that? And then one day I'm standing at the door and there's a bird guy there and he starts talking to me about migration. And I thought, well, he was talking about the hummingbird going from the shed to Costa Rica. And I've been to Costa Rica, it's a long trip, you know, and I, I took my mother. 
and she was not happy. You know, we got off and dealt. And I thought, this guy went all the way to Costa Rica. And so I thought, well, I'll do a book on migration, and I'll learn what goes through Chicago and that kind of thing. So that's what this is. Um, that's what migrates in your house in the winter. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Um, but that's the first one I did, which, you know, I try to tell my students, you just do it. I just put the United States on the left and Costa Rica on the right, and I'll figure out how to do the other 50 plates later. You know, you just go. Um, that's what bad things happen, a storm along the lake. And that's how many birds we lost during that one storm. Um, I'll keep shorebirds. They change their colors for fall. I love that. You know, like the new fashion in fall. That's, this is just, I started working with a photographer. And so Anna wants to tell stories. And I love stories. This is a crane mating dance. Look, he's, he's really trying. And she turns away. She's like, I don't, I don't care that you're that cute. OK, then the next thing I got really obsessed with was flocks, because I was working with that photographer. And I had them all laying on the floor one day, and I was teaching composition the next day. And I was talking about John Ruskin's Nine Laws of Composition. And I realized the birds had read Ruskin. You know, I mean, I, they, they were doing the nine laws of composition. It was just sort of amazing. This is, so I did a, you know, I had, you know, did that for a while. Then I thought, you know, now I'm in probably my 30th year there. Maybe I'll just go behind the scenes where nobody goes and I'll do drawings from there about collection. So that's what this stuff is. Um, was that ever fun? Like I walked into the frog lab, and like, you got anything? And he like had that jar of 100 frogs. I was like, well, my, Merry Christmas. My day is made. My week is made. My month is made, you know? It was just, it's just subject matter, endless subject matter. And how could it get any better? Oh, then I did a Paragon book, um, which was fun because I got to include architecture again. It was more like what I did in the beginning. Um, yeah, and that Peter was telling us a story today, was that, you know, they, they were endangered and they got released here by Mary Hanna. And so you couldn't do anything if they came and landed on your, you know, $10 million condo deck. You had to stay inside or it would attack you. You know, so Mary would go knock on the door and go, no, well, I'm sorry, but you can't go on your deck, you know, because that guy will. So that, that whole experience, I got to go back to where did they choose to nest? They were cliff dwellers. First, they went for the most expensive stuff on Lakeshore Drive, which I love, you know. Then, then they did things like behind St. Mark's Church, or is that the other one? Yeah. Okay, and then I'm just hopping along to, I do a lot of work for people in Peru, scientists. A woman is doing a piece about, this fish is about eight feet long. And I love painting their, their things, you know. And so I've been doing underwater things for a while, and then Anna arrives. I mean, really, what could be more, how could it, there be more fun to be had? Well, there we are. So that began, this process here. So, yeah, it just, uh, I'm very grateful to be able to team up with somebody so devoted and knowledgeable and et cetera, et cetera. These last few pictures at the end of our talk here are pictures from the book that Peggy and I are working on, which is going to be, we haven't titled it yet, perhaps Mighty Small or Living Dust, or I don't know quite what the title will be, but um, Tiny Beauties. Uh, anyway, it's um, not only pollen, it's going to have diatoms and other things in it. And each panel will have, um, like this one, uh, this is the first panel we made for it. Um, 
It's about the rusty patch bumblebee, the first uh, bee to go on the endangered species list. It's there with the lynx and the wolf. Um, and the rusty patch bumblebee um, used to live, you can see this whole area that Peggy's painted in pink wash here, that was its range. But now it can only be found at these dots. 0.1% um, of its range. Um, it's really endangered, um, like many other bumblebees. And so um, I gave Peggy this picture of a map and um, some bees, just I create this kind of PowerPoint out of those for her. Um, I gave her a list of the bees' favorite flowers and she could pick what she wanted to paint. And she picked the cherry and goldenrod and rose and coneflowers. Um, and then we looked up what the pollen grains would be for those. And so these are the pollen grains for each. Um, and what we're trying to do with each of these panels is create a context for the beautiful little thing that would attract people to dwell a little longer on it. And actually, um, a list of some things that are possible um, that Peggy and I can do uh, that we wouldn't have been able to do with a snapping a photo through a microscope, for instance. Um, so here are some things we can do. We can include multiple perspectives and planes if we're drawing instead of snapping a photo. You're limited to just the one perspective when you do that. Um, we can play with scale. We could put, um, Peggy has been putting tiny foraminifera in front of the pyramids because they um, actually make up the stones of the pyramids are made of foraminifera. So we can play with our scale. We can show characteristics of more than one specimen. When you snap an, an image, a photographic image of something, you're limited to it. Perhaps it's a little wrinkled or not quite characteristic of the whole. Um, and this way we can kind of make composites that are truth about the whole species or something like that. And then finally, we, the, my favorite is that we can provide the context and the background for each of these little things. So for instance, I gave Peggy this picture. These are different diatoms species and they're different colors and there's there are many people studying this actually um, the color of the earth is changing with climate change um, different areas are shifting in their shades and from space wouldn't it be nice if we could decode what species are having big blooms in what areas of the earth based on the color and so they will go and they'll sample the color for different species and then you can use that for a satellite image to say who's living where, when, um, based on the colors. And you can see that when they're in these pure cultures, they really have strikingly different culture, you know, colors from each other. This is going on in China. These are pear blossoms that have to be hand pollinated because the bee pollinators have become too scarce. And um, we, I think I want a panel. Peggy has yet to paint it, but, um, but with something like this, they send the kids up into the trees to hand pollinate each, uh, because the branches are so fine, um, to climb up and to dust each one because there's no bee to do it. Um, here in the U.S., the almond farmers, um, they have a tremendous challenge to pollinate uh, their almond orchards. Um, million, a million imported hives a year into California just for the almonds. Um, and there are half a million there already. And you set them up two to an acre. Um, that's a lot of bees for one acre of almond flowers. And some almond orchards are actually being pulled up because there's just, you can't, the, the um, boxes, this is a truck coming loaded with boxes, with beehives um, to California to unload them for a brief period at somebody's farm. And then it'll move on, they're transitory, they move around the country to different um, crops. Um, and in this picture, you can see the blueberries um, in Michigan. They dropped in one year their crop of blueberries because of a lack of pollinators dropped from 98 million tons to 63 million tons. That's a big decrease. And they were moving in eight boxes, eight hives of honeybees an acre to try to handle this. But honeybees don't like pol um, blueberries very much. Um, bumblebees like them much better. And the fact that you would take eight 
hives, which are 150,000 bees for a space about the size of this room, you know, that's crazily in inefficient. And they're still not pollinating the, the blueberries very well. Um, there's also a pollinator problem on the tart cherries up here um, because we're losing our pollinators. So we can capture in these panels um, all these stories and it's just a delight to share them with Peggy and to discover them and, to, um, and then to hand a whole bunch of possibilities to her and have her arrange something like this that holds that whole story. Um, here's what happened when I talked to her about the colors of pollen. So remember I said that you could pseudo color pollen, but it wasn't, why well, do that when it's so beautifully colored itself? Um, so if you get little piles of pollen from different species, you can really tell them apart, like Dorothy Hodge's drawings that were different colors. Um, and if you look in a honeycomb, you can see different colors being stacked into the cells of the, of the comb. And up here, you can see them in cross section, showing that as the bees arrive and they load them into the, um, into the comb, you can see the colors of each load um, to make bee bread. It ferments in there, um, and they eat that. Um, so it's, it's multicolored, multi-layered bee bread. Um, so these are some of what she did with the colors when I told her about the colors. When I told her about coccolithophores, this is what Peggy created. Um, coccolithophores are um, what chalk is made of. That's their tiny little exterior shells. Um, they bring down millions of tons of carbon from the air each year um, down to the bottom of the ocean where I said they build up, you know, like a kilometer deep. And um, when those get pushed up, like here on the White Cliffs of Dover, you're pushed up where we can see that deep coccolithophore um, deposit um, is now accessible. And you can actually take a chalk stick and draw a coccolithophore with coccolithophores, <laughs> which I think is really great. So, um, so chalk is, is um, made of their beautiful little skeletons. Their skeletons are incredibly diverse. Some look like, you know, morning glories or phonograph. Um, here, these look like little hubcaps. And they fall off of the coccolithophores into the water where they sparkle um, like glitter. And they make our earth lighter colored so it reflects the sun and um, doesn't heat up as much. So coccolithophores are in general thought to be good for um, global warming, to have more coccolithophores. Um, so uh, they're incredibly diverse and lovely. The entire little thing is um, one of the smallest of our tiny beauties. I think it might be the smallest and is only maybe two micrometers across. Um, so really, really small. Um, these are much smaller than pollen grains, which would be more like 20 or 50 micrometers across. But they still have beautiful, um, beautiful detail to their shells. And those little hubcaps, when they fall off, are just sparkling in the water and reflecting the sunlight back up. Oh, and actually in Kansas, we have a coccolithophore um, uh, area where the inland sea used to be and it left coccolithophores and now the sea is gone but we still have um, these uh, lovely structures standing out in the fields in Kansas. Um, so not only the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, so we're still working on this one. Peggy's gonna, I don't know if you want to step up here and talk too, but um, I told her about the pink, the pink beaches of Bermuda and those are foraminifera. And foraminifera, um, here are some pictures of foraminifera. Um, they are little predators, they're like little animals rather than little plants. They're not photosynthetic like the earlier ones I was telling you about. These ones are, they hunt. And, um, but some of them have pink shells and it yields these beaches when you have millions and millions and millions of them. They'll make the beaches look pink. Um, but they have gorgeous, if you looked in the sand in the microscope and you just looked closer and closer and closer, you'd finally see these lovely little structures. And from these structures, they extend whiskers, these tiny, tiny philopodia that reach out in all directions and are part of their predatory behavior. And we also think they increases their surface area, these tiny filamentous projections in all directions. Um, 
there's some estimates that foraminifera, which live on the floor of the ocean, they um, have the same surface area as all of the bacteria in the ocean combined, which is extraordinary. That is a very large surface area. Um, and they're getting it with these fine thread-like projections that come out of their bodies. Um, they also are the source of the rock for the Egyptian pyramids. So Peggy's working on um, a foraminifera painting that would have the pyramids in the background. Um, the insect uh, eggs, another incredibly numerous, incredibly beautiful little structure. Um, we have quintillion insects on Earth. Um, that's 10 to the 17th. Um, and even more eggs, right, <laughs> in order to get that many insects. And um, so lots and lots and lots of eggs. And boy, are they pretty little structures. Um, so here are some butterfly eggs with the butterflies that come from each um, that Peggy painted. Um, and there is a whole nother story, a whole nother panel I'm hoping Peggy will take on about um, mimicry. So some plants will try to keep insects from laying their eggs on them by mimicking it as if they'd already been taken. So on their leaves, the passion flower, for instance, does this. It makes what looks like a little strew of insect eggs on its leaf, but it built them. They're not actually insect eggs, they're mimics. And then when the insect arrives, it thinks, oh, this has already been taken. Is the lot, I'll move on. You know, this leaf has already been populated with eggs. Um, and so it leaves the plant alone. Um, and so this is a trick that plants have devised. Um, I'd love to make a panel about that story. So there are many different stories available to us. Um, and uh, this is a drawing, actually a science and art drawing from developmental biologist um, Johannes Holtfreder. And I just love it. Let me show you what it does. On one side, he has a uh, feelings and art and then we can spin it around and we get intellect and ratio and science and um, Johannes Holtfreder was a scientist and an artist both um, tried to get them to work together in him um, and ended up drawing embryos uh, that was his his gig but uh, what he wrote around it in German is that he has these two um, two hearts that are battling in his one breast, if you read German around the outside there, of his intellect and his feeling, the artist and the scientist in one. Well, I want to thank um, Lurie Garden uh, very much for having us. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then uh, for the Fulbright Scholarship and um, the museums that I visited to get all those images I shared with you tonight, and the School of the Art Institute for bringing me to Laura's attention. <laughs> so that, um, and I had just such a wonderful um, semester there and met Peggy. Um, so if you want to learn more about Gunnar Ertmann, I have a few articles about him, um, and here's one of them up here as well. So we would love questions. Um. Okay, Peter and Yadi have mics now, so they're going to come find you, and so I'll, I'll point. But first, maybe I'll start with a question. Um, these are some wonderful stories that we heard, and I'm just curious from Peggy, what was, what was maybe a pollen that you wanted to draw based on this, these stories that you, that you wanted to convey in the book that maybe you struggled with? Like, what's a, what's a plant species that had a difficult pollen to render? Oh, I, I struggle. That's one every day. You know, I never, I never get it right, which is the fun, you know? It's three strikes, um, and you just keep on. If you can just persist, um, sometime it will resolve itself in time, which is a lot like the way things grow, you know? They look like they aren't gonna make it, and then it rains and they come along. So nature has taught me to just sit it out, the problems, and, and not take it personally when something doesn't work. That's the, my message to all people who wanna do art. I mean, it's the process that matters, and if you need it to be really good, you know, that it won't be any fun. I mean, of course you love it when it works, 
but it doesn't need to work. And then for me, collaboration has become the fun part. I mean, I, I, and a lot of contemporary art doesn't speak to me as much as what I've been doing and people doing what I'm doing. I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm not deep. <laughs> I, uh, that's for sure. I'm, not, I'm a shallow person, and so I like, I don't you know, so. science is pretty basic. So anyway. But yes. it's been a technical challenge for you with glassy little shells. Yes, yes. She's been struggling with glass. Oh, I'm not sure that you're all hearing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll get it. Uh, uh, yeah, oops, like the diatoms actually are silica. It's actual glass, the beautiful shells of the diatoms. And the light that shines through them, Peggy and I have sat at the microscope and tried to capture how it's affected like a physical, it's a little prism. They have physical color, just like um, bird feathers and uh, butterfly colors and um, fish scales. It's actually a little prism, glass prism that is changing, bending the light to get the different colors. And boy, is that a challenge for you to get the clear shell, but still. So we've been talking about um, some of these things. I say, well, I want you to get the bird inside the cage. You know, like, can we get, um, can we get the glowing little cell inside the cage of its, of its shell as well? And how to balance those things. But her head is filled with knowledge and mine isn't. So <laughs> one of the challenges, like, I got to catch up with, you know, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay. so, oh, we've got one here. Blake? Okay, Peter will bring you the mic and then. Hey ladies, this is, this is Blake, and I want to ask you a, a, a question about poll, 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 pollination and how, how do na native pollinators get affected by, 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 by non-native non, non pollinating plants? And how will the how, how will our native insects react to 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 it? And is it, is it, is it better off for us to focus on the native po po pollinating plants or both the native or non-native pollinating plants to help draw more bees and, and other pollinators? Well, one of the things that struck me about non-native um, plants, um, that, that panel that has the, um, you're asking like, the, do pollinators um, respond to non-native plants? Oh. There, this one. Um, you might think, so I had found a list of favorite plants that um, this particular endangered bee loved. And, um, you know, these would be native plants that they would have found for a long time in this area, um, including the coneflower here. Um, but uh, actually, uh, there's so many cultivars of coneflowers. When I was looking this up, I thought, oh, well, this is great. We're feeding, you know, so many people plant these flowers. Um, there's plenty for this bee. We're really helping them out. But in fact, the cultivars, um, you're saying non-native. Well, what about these things that we create um, that have especially showy centers or are inaccessible or sterile. Um, so in some of these cone flowers, they're inaccessible to the bee. So you think you're planting the right thing, but it's not, the bee can't even get into it to get anything from it. It can't physically access the nectar. Or it's a sterile plant, doesn't make any pollen. So there's nothing for the, for the bees to get. So you really do need to pay attention to, um, you, know, you might think that you're doing right by them and giving them their favorite food, but if you pick a different cultivar, <laughs> it won't help them out. Um, roses, for instance, here, um, they need to be open and single like this, like a wild rose. If you picture the roses that are all tight for a bouquet, you know, florist roses, uh, there's no way a pollinator is getting in there, right? It won't be able to access a pollen or nectar in the center of a closed up, tight, many petaled rose. There's no access. And thus, you never get any rose hips. 
from those. Do you notice you only get rose hips from the kind that are open like this and can actually be fertilized. The pollinators can get there and get the pollen on and you can make a fruit from them. But the ornamental roses are too tight closed, no access. So um, that's, <laughs> that's a bit of an answer about non-native versus native. Um, if we mess with these things, the pollinators can't um, benefit from them. Hold a second, Blake. We have to get the mic to you for the question, but we're going to have Revan up here ask a question, and then we'll go back to you. There was so much information coming out of this person here. <laughs> I was wondering, um, is there any way that that was taped for us to listen to again? I had trouble understanding a lot because of the microphone. Uh -oh. But I, I don't know. Is that a possibility? It was taped, oh, and you wonderful. can, yes, it'll be on CAN oh, TV. Wonderful. Yeah. That, my, my other question is the, the sheer amount of pollen and the depth in the oceans of pollen, layers and layers and layers, is so astounding to me. I was wondering if the increase of the temperature in the world, is that affecting the amount of pollen being Yes, and humidity too. We're going to have um, a chapter on spores in our book, on fungal spores. And fungal spores, there are like 40 million tons of fungal spores that can be released from a forest and come up and they seed the clouds. They're so important at, at a number of levels, um, these tiny things, so that would affect the weather. Right, so then there would be a climate change that would affect the um, number of fungal spores released and then that could affect the actual weather, how much it rains or doesn't because they are involved in seeding the clouds. Um, pollen grains never decay. So the wall is one of the most durable substances known to man actually. You can put it in hydrofluoric acid which will eat through glass and rock and everything and won't eat through the pollen grain wall. And that means that every Every pollen grain that has ever been made on Earth is still here. It's in the soil, it's on the bottom of the ocean, it's still here with us. And Gunnar Ertmann was part of the earliest efforts to core down through these deep layers that you just mentioned and pull up samples and try to understand how the climate had changed, what's happened over millions of years, because the record is still there in those pollen grains. You can tell what kind of forest used to be there, what kind of temperature used to be um, based on the pollen record. It shows it to you. It's a readout of what's come before. And so people use not only pollen, but also coccolithophores and diatoms and things like that, and they can see what's happened in the past with climate change and then looked at then apply it to now um, what we expect to happen as things are changing yeah and just a quick another one I'm, I'm sorry but this is just when you were talking what about the effect of pollen or, or warmth on the increase of algae bloom is, is there any connection Oh, well, yeah, yeah, no, I, um, so the algae bloom, no, 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 you've got, so um, sometimes there, it can be t awful for us. So these little organisms, um, their life strategy is a boom and bust, boom and bust, not pollen so much, um, though you can have like a mast year for tree nuts or something like that, but a boom and bust in the levels of diatoms or um, coccolithophores that I was mentioning. And so you can watch there, that was one of the panel ideas I had for Peggy was to draw mathematical curves, you know, in the back, showing the boom and bust, and then we would float the pollen grains in front. When there's a boom, it can really be toxic and bad. It can kill the fish, it can poison all the clams, so the clam fishermen are, you know, so we can have real problems with huge algae blooms that are visible from space. So recently the Bering Straits changed color and they hired a bunch of coccolithophore people to come in and try to figure out why the Bering Straits had changed color. Um, and there's a big bloom happening and they followed over the last several years the color of the wo water there to follow what's happening with the boom and bust cycles of these little organisms. Um, yeah, mighty and sometimes toxic, yes. Okay, back here in the green. Uh, 
Uh, for Dr. Ed, uh, Edlund, um, the coccolithophores, you described them as being really beneficial, capturing carbon. Can they be farmed? Can they be generated and produced? Well, you could create, yeah, enormous, people do that with algae. Um, they'll grow huge, uh, like algae farms, yeah, and to try to harvest those to use for fuels and things. Oh, hey, speaking of fuels, these things, when they go down to the bottom of the ocean, eventually they turn into oil, and oil companies are very interested in, they hire some of the only jobs out there for palynologists, coccolithophore, you know, scientists, um, is for them to work for oil companies. And they'll go out on these rigs and they, um, as they're drilling, the huge equipment is really expensive per year, or per day, per hour, and they need to aim just right into the right areas as they're getting their oil. And so they, um, they ask the scientists, are we in the right time period? You know, take a look at these, these species that you're seeing under your microscope right now. Should we move slightly down? Should we move slightly up? Where should we go in the time period based on these layers of these creatures? Um, so sorry, that was a diversion. But yes, you could absolutely harvest these or on purpose try to, um, I mean, the, the numbers across the globe. One of the ideas for a panel for Peggy was um, they now have um, a picture of the globe. You can spin the globe around and based on meta science, many, many scientists have contributed to the levels of different species of different organisms uh, on the earth. And you can see that the diatoms are off down at the poles and then there's the coccolithophores in this area and then there, and, um, we were looking at what's in the Great Lakes and these are enormous, enormous numbers of these things. Very beneficial in, in most cases. Um, they're reflecting the light, they're taking the carbon dioxide out of the air. They're our friends, but um, uh, like you said, if you get them at too high a number, they can be toxic as well. Um, and certainly their levels are changing. Those global maps are changing every year. You can see how they're shifting and the regions that they populate on Earth are changing. The species are changing. One, one other question, sorry. Um, the you described the pollen uh, tubes. Uh, they exit the pollen grain and, and travel down to fertilize. Um, do they separate from the pollen grain or stay connected? Oh, actually, they're pretty neat. They're, um, they stay connected all the way back up to the grain. Um, they're a bit like a nautilus. If you look at a beautiful nautilus shell, as the animal gets larger and larger, it moves into the bigger part of the nautilus shell, and then it builds a wall behind it and then it just lives in front of that. And then when it gets a little too tight in the shell, it moves into a slightly bigger part of the spiral, and then it builds a little wall behind it. Can you picture the Nautilus, what it looks like in cross-section? Pollen tubes do this. It would have to be very big, a single cell that was really long to get all the way from, you know, say on a corn silk to get all the way, that's a long distance, that's a long cell. Um, instead of doing that, it builds little walls and then it moves its whole cytoplasm up in front of that little wall. So the, the tube is striped. It has little walls, just like the little walls in the Nautilus going back. And then the living cell is in the front most of those, and it's just empty up behind it. But there's a record of where it's been. It's left this trail back, going all the way back up to the pollen grain itself. Okay, last question. I think Blake was, he had one more, but um, maybe the mic microphone, yeah. And do you know, Blake also goes to the Field Museum to draw a lot, and um, a lot of times when he goes to museums to draw, he get, people give him a hard time, but the Field Museum is, is uh, very um, helpful and lets him bring his chair, and I think that's really, really cool. I want to ask, are we better off buying straight native plants or plants that are non-natives non that are non-invasive non and not threatening to the local ecosystems? I would think such a plant, if it was non-invasive and non-threatening, would be a, a, a benefit to the pollinators. Planting plants that perhaps, you know, it's from Japan and yet there's, the pollinators here can benefit from it. Um, 
perhaps I'm saying something uh, contentious, <laughs> but um, depending on who you're trying to raise, are you trying to raise native plants, are you trying to raise native pollinators, who are you trying to raise? Um, so I'd say if you're trying to raise pollinators, then I would feed them. Um, and try to raise them that way uh, and not worry as much about whether it was a native or not the plant itself. If it was non-invasive, um, like you just said, I, I would go for feeding the pollinators. Oh, okay, one more, one more. The boom bust way of life, yeah. Um, uh, no, well, so boom, you have a huge increase in numbers and then bust, they all die off. So they use up all the oxygen or they get, they clog all the fish gills and the fish die and suddenly just the whole thing crashes. Um, well, it's got a bit of a philosophical meaning to it, you know, like you overpopulate and then you crash. Um, I guess they're not the only ones that do that. Um, yeah, but they can be happening in a lot of different parts of the world, right? There's no way to control them. There's just a way it happens. Well, and a lot of things have evolved to take advantage of it. So if you were a whale that ate phytoplankton and krill and things like that, you would go to the place where the boom happens each year and you would feast and you would get fat in that place and then you could swim you know you could migrate this hooks to her migration if you knew that there were booms near the poles each year you could go there to have a feast and then leave and migrate to another place and so some of these boom bust cycles have affected many species simultaneously because they eat those things and then the things that eat those things these are at the bottom of the food chain um, these tiny organisms, it's hugely plentiful, um, but eaten by many, many other things. And they are um, timed, right? Like they know when the booms are going to happen and they go there purposefully sort of, you know, in order to eat. Okay, well, please welcome to our reception over here for further questions. And I just want to thank um, the staff of Lurie Garden and the volunteers who made this all possible. So they'll be joining you if you have any more questions about the garden as well.